Assalamu alaikum. Today we will begin with lecture 12 and I will look at the second poem of Shelley with you. The poem is titled Old to Ode to Al Skylark. In the previous lecture, in, in fact in the previous two lectures, uh, we discussed his uh, other ode which is Ode to a West Wind. And uh, we saw uh, how Shelley's revolutionary ideas, how his ideas about change and how his ideas about reform um, in the social and the political structures of the society uh, are, are uh, demanded through his poet poetic work. In fact, Shelley uses the West Wind as, a, uh, as an inspiration. He uh, sees it uh, as, a, as a source of power he is, uh, looks around him and he notices the change that the west wind can bring about in nature how it brings uh, an end to one season and um, brings up a new season so Shelley seeks inspiration from the west wind in that poem today we're going to look at his uh, other ode which is this time again uh, addressed to a natural object it's not uh, a natural an unnatural object that's not uh, uh, visible he is going to pay tribute to a bird this time and it is a skylark he pays tribute to the song of the skylark in fact he cannot see the bird he's not inspired by the beauty of the bird it's uh, he's not inspired by the abilities of the bird as he was with the west wind it was the the power uh, the abilities uh, of the west wind the strength of the west wind that had uh, inspired him then and he wanted to use the same power that the west wind had to bring about the similar kind of changes in the society so he wanted also uh, like the west wind uh, to bring about the destruction of all the old uh, norms and introduce uh, new life with new ideas and with new institutions so here it's uh, he does not seek inspiration from the power of the bird from the strength of the bird it is a delicate bird the skylark it's a delicate small bird but it's called a powerful uh, mesmerizing fascinating beautiful voice and it is the song of the bird that has actually captivated the poet once again the poem is inspired uh, from a personal experience the poet uh, can listen to the song of the bird he cannot see the bird but he listens to the song of the bird and he's lost into the world of the bird but he's not detached from his own world like Keats uh, when he uh, listens to the song of the nightingale he becomes part of the world of the nightingale or when he writes an ode to the urn or is describing the scenes that are etched on the urn he gets lost into the world into that world uh, Shelley uh, remains intact his connection with reality his connection with the real world remains intact he's not lost completely in that other world because and that you all know is because uh, his he wants to convey a message through his poem there is a message in his poems and that message is for reform, for hope in the future, uh, for change, for better, betterment in the future. That is why when he speaks, he, uh, he, he speaks keeping in mind, mind the present world. So let us look at the poem. It is simply written but beautifully composed. It consists of uh, uh, short stanzas as you, as you can see. Uh, there are sh short stanzas and the language is simple, the diction, vocabulary is not complicated or complex. Ideas uh, are f uh, such that we are all familiar with, but it is the, the message that he wants to give and uh, it is the idea of happiness uh, that he wants to communicate through the song or the happiness of the Skylark. That is an important theme of this poem. So let us begin with the poem itself now before we look at the text of the poem uh, let, let us briefly discuss what the poem uh, uh, is about 
so as in the previous poem uh, with uh, Ode to the West Wind where West Wind was personified it was personified as a mighty spirit it was personified as a powerful spirit it was a spirit that was everywhere it was in the skies it was in the earth it was uh, in the oceans and it was a spirit that inspired awe that inspired feelings of fear in uh, in the hearts of every object of nature uh, the leaves uh, ran away the the dying leaves autumn leaves they were running away uh, scattering in different directions as a wind, uh, west wind approached the simile that he gives you is that of a magician so uh, that is the awe inspiring nature of west wind similarly the clouds they are scattering they're changing shifting positions in the sky out of fear of uh, the impression that Shelley wants to give you is that uh, it is out of the awe, it is out of fear of the west wind that they are shifting position and out of awe, you know, one uh, year dies and uh, the wind itself sings the last song of the dying year and then out of fear he tells us in the third part how the vegetation in the, uh, under the ocean that trembles, it trembles, even the ocean waves they tremble and they're, sh uh, they're shivering uh, f for fear of the west power of the west wind. So such is the impact of the west wind, such is the fearful impact of the west wind. So it comes out as a s strong spirit, as a fierce spirit. In the same way here you will see that the skylark is personified as a spirit. It is not just an object of nature but the way Shelley is going to address the bird, the way Shelley is going to address Skylark, it is as if it is a, sp it is a spirit of some kind. It is a spirit which can uh, uh, teach about happiness, which can teach about morals to mankind. So it is a kind of a celestial being, but we will see Shelley questioning the nature of the bird uh, itself in the poem. And as a bird you see soars into the sky, singing happily, she's hidden from view, but her song fills the earth and the sky. Just like the west wind was everywhere, it was all around, it had, uh, uh, it had covered all spaces from the sky to the earth, in the same way the bird, its bird's song, the bird's singing, it has filled up the whole universe, it has filled up the skies and it has filled up the earth. And the bird's song is a symbol of happiness and peace. So it's the song of the bird, it is the singing of the bird that is uh, important here and that is used uh, as a metaphor for happiness and peace and that is used uh, uh, for inspiration here, that is looked up to for inspiration. And we shall see that uh, the skylark and the singing of the skylark, the song of the skylark, it, uh, it is described through different images in the poem. Shelley uh, creates for you uh, different uh, similes and he describes the singing skylark, he describes the song of the skylark uh, through different uh, metaphors in the poem or similes in the poem and uh, some, uh, in one stanza he describes the singing bird uh, with the poet composing a poem and some uh, and another, another stanza he describes the singing skylark uh, as a maiden in love as a young girl singing her song uh, about love and uh, in the third stanza he describes it as a glow worm which gives out light in the darkness which spreading light in the darkness and then as a rose which spreads fragrance in the air and also he's, it is compared to the sound of the rain. So Mary Shelley uh, wrote uh, a bit about the poem, I am going to read it out to you. She said, in the spring we spent a week or two near Ligon. It was on a beautiful summer evening while wandering among the lanes whose myrtle hedges were the bowers of the fireflies that we heard the caroling of the skylark. As I told you in the very beginning, the poet was inspired by the song of the bird and as a result of which he composed these lines. 
So it was. It is based on a personal experience, as uh, Mary Mary Shelley's own comments verified. But she also mentions some other things. She says, as they were wandering among the lanes, they saw fireflies. They saw the glow worms, uh, which uh, Shelley also mentions in his poem. So he sought inspiration from all these objects of nature, and uh, he, in fact, even. Uh, created images from nature to describe this object of nature. And like the Ode to the West Wind, the Skylark was inspired by a specific experience. Shelley is inspired by the happiness in the song of the bird. This is what I've just explained. And then there are two main lines of thought in the poem. The first is to understand what the bird stands for or is comparable to. So in the first half of the poem, you shall see Shelley trying to find out, trying to know uh, what the bird is about. So he's looking into the nature of the bird and it's singing, both. So he is uh, uh, trying to judge uh, what it is com uh, com comparable to because he's going to associate the bird, compare the bird to different other objects to show to you what it means to him or what the song of the bird means to him. And in the second half of the poem, he's going to look at the secret behind the skylark's happiness. The happiness that is visible from the song of the bird, he's, he's going to find out why the bird is singing so happily, why the bird is so happy, what is the reason behind the, hap uh, behind this, the happy song that she's singing. So uh, the poem, you can say, is divided into two parts. Uh, because in one part he's exploring the nature of the word, the identity of the word, and its singing. And in the second part he's uh, trying to find clues as, uh, to the happiness of the word. Let us now look at the text of the poem itself. And let us see how a Shelley pays tribute to this bird, the Skylark. Hail to thee light spirit. This is how he begins. He says, hail to the light spirit. He's happy. He's welcoming the bird. So when we welcome, want to welcome someone, we say hail. Hail, hail queen, the queen. Hail the king. So he's welcoming the bird. He's happy uh, that the bird is, uh, has lightened up the atmosphere with its singing. But you see in the very first line, he calls it the spirit. But he, uh, he puts together the two words that form uh, the theme of the poem also. The bird is addressed as a spirit. It is not something that uh, has no feelings or emotions and it uh, cannot uh, teach us any moral lesson. It is something that has got a spirit. It's got it can feel, it's got its own emotions and he tells us that it is a blithe spirit. Blithe means happy. So he calls her, the bird a happy spirit. He says, bird thou never wert, that from heaven or near it pourest thy full heart in profuse strains of unpremeditated unpre art. Bird thou never wert, and hyphen. He says, he doesn't call her a bird. He says, you were always a spirit. O oh, Skylark, you were never a, just a bird. You were always a spirit. Because you always had a lesson to teach to us. Then he says, that from heaven or near it pours thy full heart. As I said earlier on, it, uh, he gives it a divine status also. Because he says that this the song of the bird seems to be, com be coming from the heavens, because the bird is soaring above in the sky. Uh, it is uh, hidden from view because of the clouds. So Shelley cannot see the bird soaring in the sky, hidden from view because of the clouds. But he can hear the song of the bird pouring down from the sky, and uh, you know, uh, lighting up the whole environment lightening up the whole environment. So he says, 
as if you, you know, the song is coming from heaven, from above, and here it pours thy full heart. It is, it is pouring out his full heart. It is singing with full emotions, with full feeling of happiness, in profuse strains of unpremeditated, unpremeditated uh, means without thinking. So it is thinking in profuse. Profuse once again means intense. So full of emotions, a bird is that it is singing a song in profuse, intense strain and uh, without thought it continues, it is continuing. So maybe you can compare, if you haven't heard, ever heard the Skylark song, you can compare her song to the song of the cuckoo bird which we all are familiar with, the, the bird that we have, the black bird, uh, the quail, which sings whenever it rains uh, even these days it's, uh, you can hear its uh, song or in the season of monsoon you can hear its song. So the bird uh, is singing with intense feelings. Higher still and higher from the earth thou springest. Like a cloud of fire the blue deep thou wingest and singing still dost soar and soaring ever singest. You see how he in the last line he uses alliteration the sir sound singing still dost say soar and soaring ever singest. Uh, he uses these alliterations, these similar sounds with uh, the poets in fact all poets use it to uh, emphasize a certain thing. Shelley here also is using it uh, to give it a kind of sonority, to give it a kind of, you know, uh, a heightened uh, sense of uh, intensity. So he says, the higher and higher from the earth thou springest. The bird is soaring away from the earth. It is climbing the sky. It is going higher and higher towards the sky. Like a cloud of fire. So he can't see it, he says, you are uh, from this distance where we are on the earth, you appear to us like a cloud of fire. So it is a simile, he's comparing it to a cloud which is on fire. Uh, clouds are not actually on fire. A cloud appears to be on fire when it is lighted from the uh, sunlight, which is the sun which is sinking in the evening time, uh, the reddish orangish sunlight as it hits the clouds it puts them aflame so that that is what he's creating for you so the bird also and this was the evening time as Shelley will tell us later on so the uh, this is evening time and he listens to the bird singing and he see and he can imagine it soaring higher and higher in the sky he says like a cloud which has caught fire from the setting sun the blue deep thou wingest, the blue deep, he says, you're entering the blue deep, the deepening skies as, a sky, as the evening uh, time approaches, as the sun starts to set, the sky first uh, turns deeper blue, deeper blue, and then it changes, goes, it goes up, uh, goes on to change, take shades of purple and then black. So uh, he says, the blue deep thou wingest, as you soar high, the uh, sky turns deep blue and singing still does soar and soaring ever singers. The significant thing is that he says as you are soaring, as you are flying high above, you are singing and as you are soaring, you are always singing. So he says the s song never stops. You don't need uh, to pause for rest, but it, you, you're, you keep on singing. So the song is continuous, without pause, without break. In the golden lightning of the sunken sun, over which clouds are brightening, thou dost float and run like an unbodied joy whose race is just begun. Now this, as the sun is setting, the whole atmosphere turns golden as it is in the evening time. So he says in the golden lightning of the sunken sun. As the sun is setting, as it is sinking, 
the uh, everything turns golden and he says over which the clouds are brightening and the top of the cloud still carries a light uh, the setting light thou dost float and run he says now he's imagining it he ha cannot see the bird the bird as I said is hidden from the view of the poet he can see the dense clouds above but he knows that the song or uh, from uh, the way the song is reaching him that it is the bird is in the sky and it, if it is in the sky it must be hidden from his view because of the cloud so he says he imagines now the, the bird floating and then running floating and running now running is not associated with birds he says he imagines the bird also running as if it's got uh, with the feet that it's got it is running on the surface of the cloud like an unbodied joy whose race is just begun so unbodied is unbounded uh, extreme joy uh, extreme joy but it also suggests energy unbodied it also suggests energy says with that energy uh, that uh, those people have who, whose race has yet to begun who are standing behind the line ready for race and they're full filled with energy and hope so he says he um, compares the bird to uh, so f uh, to someone who's so full filled with energy uh, as uh, as uh, as a person who has whose race has just has, has yet to begin and it has not ended that he's tired now so it is the the spirit of the bird uh, which is full of energy that he uh, makes comparison here to then he says the pale purple even melts around thy flight like a star of heaven in the broad daylight thou art unseen but yet I hear thy shrill delight the pale purple even melts under thy flight now he says the per now the sky is turning from deeper blue it's now turning purplish and it's for pale purple he says even the pale purple melts around thy flight meaning the bird is soaring high and high and it's not stopping it's not stopping in its movement it's not even stopping its song and he says it is climbing up the sky like a star of heaven now he compares it to a star of heaven that is shining brightly from heaven he says in the broad daylight thou art unseen but yet I hear thy shrill delight the reason he compares the bird to a star of heaven is because the stars are only visible at night uh, we can only see them glimpse them at night time and uh, in the daytime their light is not visible and they are so they so they are also not visible so he compares the bird to uh, the star because he wants to say that just like the star the bird is not visible in daytime we can't see it but we can hear its song keen as are the arrows of that silver sphere whose intense lamp narrows in the white dawn clear until we hardly see we feel that it is there then he says keen as are the arrows of that silver sphere now he's talking about moon he compared her to the star now he talks about the arrows of the silver sphere these arrows these are the moonlight the moonlight leaving the moon so uh, and the, the, that spreads in all directions and it covers the earth whose intense lamp he says an intense lamp is once again uh, the moonlight he says the bright moon lap which, in, which the, in narrows in the white dawn clear and this moonlight what happens to it uh, when the dawn approaches as the dawn or the morning time approaches the moon and the moonlight becomes dim it, they become uh, dimmer until we hardly see so he says until we then there comes a moment uh, when uh, the sun is out in its full glory and it's, it's at that time that this moon and the moonlight uh, are not visible anymore so he says but 
although it is not visible, it is invisible from view, the moon is hidden from our view, its light is hidden from our view, but he says we know that it is still there, we know that it is still in the sky. In the same way, he says, oh, he is talking about the bird, the skylark and he says, although I can't see it, I can't see you, I know that you are there, I know that you are there because I can hear your song, I can hear your singing. All the earth and air with thy voice is loud. As when night is bare, from one lonely cloud, the moon rains out her beams and heaven is overflowed. Then he says, the whole air, the whole earth, he says, it is filled with thy voice. Thy means yours. So it is filled with your voice, which is loud, which is uh, ringing in, uh, uh, and has charged uh, everything in the air or in the earth. As when night is bare, from one lonely cloud, the moon rains out her beams and heaven is overflowed. And he says, the, your voice has the same effect, gives the same kind of hope and uh, gives the same kind of happiness to us, to uh, us, the human beings, to mankind as when at the time of the night, he says, the uh, uh, moon is hidden behind the cloud and the night appears to be dark, but then all of a sudden the cloud shifts and the moon with all its uh, glorious moonlight, it shines through and the whole, he says, the heavens and the earth, they are overflowed with the moonlight. So, the, he's comparing uh, the, the bird and the effect of the bird songs and the effect of uh, hope and uh, uh, the this feeling of hope and the feeling of happiness that the song of the bird arouses, he compares that to the moonlight, the sudden appearance of the moonlight from behind a cloud. So when all is, uh, when all is happening wrong, the song of the bird can lift your moods, it can give you happiness, it can give you hope. Then he says, what thou art we know not, what is most like thee, from rainbow clouds there flow not, drops so bright to see, as from thy presence showers a rain of melody. He says, we don't know what you are. I told you that in this first part he is going to talk about the nature of the bird. He is going to try and he will try and find out uh, uh, how to describe the bird to you, or who to connect it to, what to connect it to. He says, I don't know what you are or is if there is anything like you on this earth, if there is anything on this earth that I can compare you to. From rainbow clouds they flow not drops so bright to see as from thy presence so here you've got another comparison, he says, even the rainbows does not carry colors, can, cannot, uh, ha, ha, does not have more to offer as your song, as a song that showers, uh, uh, that comes like showers, that come like rain, that come like the rain of melody that comes like rain and gives hope and happiness to mankind, to the dying mankind, to the depress depressed mankind, to the sad mankind, to the dejected mankind. He says, the uh, effect of your uh, song on mankind is that it gives them hope, it gives them a feeling of happiness, it lifts their mind, it lifts their mood, it lifts their emotions. The same, he says, effect is not achieved even by the rainbow or the cloud that showers rain. So even the cloud bringing about rain uh, is, uh, is less a sign of hope than the song of the bird for Shelley here. Now begins his uh, uh, 
from this part will begin he will begin his uh, direct comparisons he's trying to discover the nature of the bird as he just told us and he wants to see if he can compare the bird and its singing to any other thing so his first comparison is to a poet he says like a poet hidden in the light of thought singing hymns unbidden till the world is wrought to sympathy with hopes and fears it he did not he compares the bird to a poet to a poet composing his own poem like the bird singing its song so it is a poet composing its own song composing its poem so he says just like this bird is hidden but its song is overflowing uh, in the whole uh, is, is uh, has overflowed the earth and the sky he says in the same way uh, it uh, it he compares the bird to a poet which is hidden whose thought who's hidden behind his thoughts who's hidden behind his works who's bit hidden behind his poems who's uh, hidden behind his plays or novels or anything so he says uh, because he's talking about poet so naturally he's talking about poetry so it must he must be talking about poems not novels or plays i'm sorry but he means uh, that as a poet is hidden behind his words he's hidden behind his thoughts and when he sings hymns hymns is a is a word used for religious poems but he uses it here to talk about the sacredness of what comes from the poet's mouth or from his mind uh, if you need to remember that for shelley the poet was like a prophet his words were prophetic they were important they had significance they could reform and change the society like a prophet and prophet's words can so this is why he uses words which uh, uh, emphasize his uh, his view of the role of the poet singing hymns unbidden till the world is wrought to sympathy with hopes and fears it he did not he says so a poet like a poet composing his poem like a poet hidden behind his own words creating his piece of art this piece of art or his work of art which can raise sympathies and hopes and fears in the hearts of people and it can affect them for change for a better change so he is comp uh, compare he is in fact uh, comparing the bird to the poet who's composing his poem to awaken the world secondly he compares it uh, this uh, singing bird to a young girl making music making music singing song to soothe her own love to make peace with her own self she's trying to soothe her own feelings and emotions so he compares the skylark and her song to a maiden and a maiden's song he says like a high born maid in a palace tower soothing a love laden soul in secret hour with music sweet as love which overflows her bower like a high born maiden she's not talking about an ordinary girl here it's a princess that she's talking about high born born to a, a high family he says like a high born maiden maiden in a palace so it's a princess because she's in a palace this may bring to your mind all these uh a uh, fairy story tales that we have for children about princesses like cinderella snowball rapunzel so uh, who, uh and especially rapunzel who's stuck in a tower high tower she's got long hair she cannot climb down and uh, she sings songs to soothe her own feelings so this is what she's he's comparing it to he says soothing a love laden soul in secret hour with music sweet as love which overflows her bower bower is the place where she lives her home uh, it's uh, it's basically it's a place of uh, it's a habitat it's a place of living so the bird is like a young girl is like a high born maiden is like a princess 
who soothing her own feelings of love and uh, 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 emotions of emotions of love uh, and is singing through her song through her music thirdly he compares the bird to a glow worm golden to the fireflies in a dell of dew scattering unbeholden its aerial hue among the flowers and grass which screen it from the view so the glow worms are also not visible easily visible to the eye it's just we can only detect them through the light the tail at the tail of the fireflies uh, there is some glowing substance which glows which twinkles in at night jugnu jin ko hum kehte hain the fireflies or the glow worms uh, which glow which give out light spread out light in darkness it is a symbol used for many poets because they cut through darkness and they spread out light so he says in a dell of dew living surrounded by dew scattering but scattering he says their aerial hue the light among the flowers and grass which screen it from the view and these will spread their light through those glass grass and the flowers which are actually hiding the insect from the view then he compares the bird to a rose like a rose and bowered covered and bowered covered completely in its own green leaves so like a rose which, which is hidden from view because its own thick green leaves are have surrounded it from all directions and why have they surrounded it he says by warm winds the flower till the scent it gives makes faint with too much sweet these heavy winged thieves he says by warm winds deflowered he is comparing it to a rose which is hidden from you but which has now lost its petal which has been deflowered because of the warm winds but as the rose deflowers the fragrance spreads the warm winds which deflowers it it also carries the fragrance of the rose it carries it and spreads it in the whole garden while there is it makes faint with too much sweet these heavy winged thieves heavy winged thieves are the the bumblebees bhamra jisko hum kehte hain it's the bumblebees that suck nectar from the uh, flowers so he says even the scent that the this wind carries and spreads all around it is so strong that it even makes faint the it even makes faint the heavy winged thieves so up till here he has compared the bird to four uh, objects and as you can see there is there are few things that are common just like the skylark is hidden from the poet's view he, it is invisible he cannot see it in the same way all these four uh, objects of nature that he's talked about they are hidden from the view so the simile that he uh, creates for you it is uh, it's not totally uh, irrelevant or different he's kept up the same um, idea he compares first uh, to a poet who's hidden behind his own work who's hidden behind his own words who's thought behind his own thought behind his own poem and then he compares uh, uh, the bird to a to a young maiden to a high born maiden and this high born maiden he says is uh, uh, it is she's hidden in a tower somewhere in a tall tower or in a palace somewhere and the passers by can only hear her singing can only hear her music can only hear her song and be affected by it and in the third part he talks about uh, the glow worm the fireflies how that too is invisible the insect is not visible because it is hi hidden in the dense thicket of the leaves and the flowers and the grass and the dews dew drops uh, it's it's just the light which makes it visible and then the rose is hidden from view because it is 
uh, surrounded from all sides by its own green leaves. But uh, we get to know of the presence of the rose through the fragrance that has spread, that spreads everywhere. So it's the, 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 the common theme that he uh, has taken and built up in all these uh, similes also. And the second thing is uh, the, the, the song. It's a message. Just like the Skylark's song, the Skylark singing uh, is, uh, is able to move the poet. And it, the, its sound, its song is resounding uh, uh, and is echoing in the whole valley. Uh, it's echoing in the, in the earth, in the skies. And uh, the poet feels that everything is affected by the song, by the beauty of the song of the bird. In the same way he says, uh, he talks about the poet's uh, words which can affect uh, with an A, which can affect change in the society, which can bring about change in ideas of other people. And then he talks about the young maiden, how her song, how her music uh, can impress all those who hear it, all the passers-by who hear it, and they cannot be, uh, but they cannot, but feel moved by her song. And then the light, the metaphor of light uh, spreading in the darkness is already uh, a very strong image of how uh, goodness prevailing over the evil, the evil values. So, Like a uh, glow worm he says, the light from the glow worm as it destroy, as it ends uh, darkness or as it uh, shows light to those who want, who, who want to find way in this dark, uh, in the dark ways of the earth. And then lastly he talks about the rose. It's not the rose that's important but it's the fragrance of the rose. And it is a fragrance that spreads, it is a fragrance that affects us. So it's the words of the poet, it's a song of the maiden or the music of the maiden. And it is the light of the glow worm. And it is the fragrance of the rose which are important because they are the messengers, they are the harbingers of change and they are the ones that can influence. So uh, the skylark, the source is invisible but it is uh, through their work, through their deeds that uh, they are, they become known. And that is how Shelley also wants to be known. He wants to be known through his work. He wants to reform and change the society through his work. Then we see that he talks about the spring showers. The vernal showers are spring showers. He says, sound of vernal showers on the twinkling grass, rain awakened flowers, all that ever was joyous and clear and fresh, thy music doth surpass. He says, the song of the bird is as welcoming as the spring showers. The spring showers are welcoming because after the long draft of winter, uh, the spring showers give life to the budding flowers, to the budding leaves, to the budding plants. Uh, all the plants that are uh, at, that uh, as the winter has now ended and are trying to bloom and uh, the buds are uh, waiting to open up the spring showers act as a catalyst they give them the the life that they require so he says but he compares not just uh, uh, not the word not just to the showers but he compares to the sound of the vernal showers so it's the song of the bird and the song of the showers. He says, on the twinkling grass, as the wind, as, as the rain falls, as the showers, spring, spring rain falls to the ground, awakens flowers, looms flowers, and makes everything, he says, joyous and clear and fresh. In the same way, he says, your music, your song, make everything, make everything joyous, clear and fresh. But he says it has more effect. It has a stronger and a more powerful effect than the spring showers. 
teach us, sprite or bird, what sweet thoughts are thine. I have never heard praise of love or wine that panted forth a flood of rapture so divine. So now he, he's coming to the other part that I told you in the very beginning. He's gradually building up towards, uh, uh, towards that other, the second part, the second half uh, of, his, uh, of his theme, which is, after he's discussed with you the nature of the word, now he's going to look at the reasons for its happiness, reasons uh, behind the word's uh, actual feeling of elation and happiness and this heightened ecstasy uh, with which it is, you know, uh, it is influencing everything around it. So he's, first he asks her, the bird, to teach us. It's not an, uh, just a bird, it's a spirit. So he says, teach us. Teach us what are your, what are your sweet thoughts. Teach us your uh, happy thoughts. How is it that you can stay happy? Tell us, teach us the art to stay happy. Teach us the art uh, to think sweet thoughts. Because he says, I have never heard a song so beautiful. He says, that panted forth a flood of rapture so divine. He says, I've never heard a song as beautiful as this one. So I've never heard a song be it in love of, uh, be it uh, be in love uh, for someone, be it about love or in praise of wine, he says, no song has ever been uh, as beautiful as your song is. It is, in fact, as he calls it divine, it's her, the song of the bird is divine because, he's, because he wants to seek, he's seeking inspiration from it and he wants uh, to learn the art. And he says, chorus, hymnal, or triumphal chant, matched with thine would be all but an empty want. So chorus, hymnal, chorus, hymnal is a religious hymn, triumphal chant, triumph means victory, success, after a battle normally. So it's a, it's a song of triumphal chant, chant is a song, so he says, what is your song? Is it a, is it a holy is song? It is a religious hymn that you are singing? Or is it a song of victory? Or then he says, match with thine would be all but an empty one. But he says, no, it can't be. Because if I compared a religious song, a religious hymn, or if I were to compare a triumphal chant to your song, they will fail in beauty, uh, in glory, in, in the power of effect. So he said, match, they, do, they have no match with your song. They would be like an empty want, an empty want. A want is like a boast or, or a, swag, a swagger, a boast. So he says, uh, your song, in fact, he wants to say that the song of the Skylark is more powerful than a religious hymn or a triumphal chant or a victory song. And he says it is a thing wherein we feel there is some hidden want. Okay, so he says, in, in those songs we feel that something is lacking. They still uh, uh, lack something, some depth, some truth. But in your song, it is profuse, it is intense, it has it is, uh, got all the truth that uh, it needs. And then he says, what objects are the fountains of thy happy strain? What fields or waves or mountains? What shapes of sky or plain? What love of thine own kind? What ignorance of pain? Now he's wondering, what the song is about, just like Wordsworth was wondering what the solitary reaper might be singing about. He was mesmerized by the song of the solitary reaper. He could not understand the song, if you remember. He couldn't rem understand the song, but he, the music and her singing had captivated him. And had captivated him so much that he started to wonder what could she be singing about. In the same way, uh, he's he is now asking himself, what could it be about? 
he says what are the objects what objects are the fountains of thy happy strain what is the reason behind this happy strain happy strain happy song happy music of yours what fields or waves or mountains because it is an a flying object it, it is a moving object it is a moving spirit he says and when it moves about it sees feels so he says what happy feels have you seen that you're bursting out in this joyous song what waves did you see what mountains what shapes of sky he says or what shapes of plain so what beauty have you seen that you're uh, singing so joyously or what life of love of thine on kind or are you singing out of love is it love pouring forth is it love pouring out of your heart what ignorance of pain this is the key this last part is significant he says what ignorance of pain he says or are you singing happily or are you singing joyously because you are ignorant of pain because you don't know you have not seen any pain you have never feel hurt you have never been uh, sad in your life is it because you are ignorant of pain is it because you have never experienced pain so he is trying to find out the secret of the happiness of this bird with a clear keen joyance languor cannot be shadow of annoyance never came near thee thou lovest but never knew love's sad satiety he says with thy clear joy keen joyance languor languor is tiredness when we feel tired he says with this sense of happiness or joy that you have they can never you can never feel tired you will never be tired oh bird that is why you keep on singing uh, when one is tired sometimes we are tired when we are burdened with so many thoughts and depressing and sad thoughts and since a bird has no ever experienced pain or has never been humbled down by sad thoughts he says you have a you have only you're only left with clear sense of joy or happiness shadow of annoyance never came near these days you were never you never had to see experience anger anger he says not even the shadow of anger came near thee thou lovest but never knew love's satiety he says you love it is apparent he says from your song that you love you have a heart that can love but he says your love is pure your love is divine your love is special because it has never experienced sadness sad satiety it has never experienced that fullness with which comes sadness after you if you've achieved love he says then we are filled with sadness sadness because uh, we maybe we are disappointed uh, that it was uh, it has ended so soon or we are disappointed because we did not uh, it did not meet our expectations so he is comparing the bird's life to the human condition here and he says that the experiences of pain annoyance tiredness and love satiety that they never came near the bird they are never part of the bird's life so these things have never been part of the bird's life he is a spirit of another world but you have to remember this it is important because he's talking about the misery of the human condition he's telling us that humans why humans a heart cannot be as happy as this bird's heart waking or asleep thou of death must deem things more true and deep than we mortals dream or how could thy notes flow in such a crystal stream he now gives you a reason the reason for the bird's happiness and that reason is similar to what keats as you shall later see uh, gives you that the bird has no thought of death the bird has no fear of death like we mortals have like we humans have 
we do not know we can never guess uh, what is on the other side of death we cannot see beyond death we cannot see the other world so we are afraid of death we don't know whether there is darkness after death or there is light after de death we don't know whether there is life after death or there is no life after death there are so many different beliefs amongst mankind so it is death which looms in the hearts of the mortals and it is because of this fear we can never be happy he says we can never be as happy as the bird is he says waking or asleep so whether we are awake or we are asleep the thought of death is always with us he says thou of death must deem things more true and deep than we mortals dream so your dreams must be more I must we have more sublime things they must be more true and deep then we dream or how could thy notes flow in such a crystal stream he says you must know not know the fear of death that is why you can sing so joyously you can your notes can flow in such crystal clear happy stream he says the skylark knows the mystery of death it knows what lies ahead of death it is a spirit it is not an ordinary bird remember that it is a spirit that shelley is addressing here and it is a spirit uh, it can uh, see beyond things it can for it past and the future uh, past and the future present and the future are connected they are not uh, separate and they are not uh, hidden from view so the bird can he shelley suggests that it can see beyond death and it knows what lies ahead of death after death so it is has no fear it is singing peacefully it is singing happily we look before and after and pine for what is not and since there is laughter with some pain is fraught our sweetest songs are those that tell us of thedest thought very popular lines you find these lines most of the time also written uh, on some of the greeting cards but they are significant lines and you shall see here that Shelley speaks about uh, the shortness of life that we have he says and he talks about the dilemma of mankind talks about the dilemma of humans he says our dilemma is that we look before and after and pine for what, it, what, what is not we are always worrying about our past worrying about the chances that we mess, missed in our past we are worrying about the, the things that we lost in the past uh, we are worried about um, people that we lost uh, in our past so uh, we, are, we are always either looking in our, towards our past or we are looking towards future we are looking at the future and worrying about the future and he says we pine for what is not another dilemma of uh, human uh, of mortals of we, us mortals is that we pine we uh, we desire for what does not exist for what is not he says for what does not exist for something that is not in our reach we desire for it we long for it and now when we can't get it naturally we are saddened we are never happy our sincerest laughter with some pain is frost and he says even when we are happy even when we are sincerely happy even when we are sincerely laughing there is some pain behind there is always some pain behind it our sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thought and this is the dilemma of man this is a dilemma of mortal that it's sweetest the most the sweetest of the sweetest song is also always filled with the feeling of pain and sadness so it's always mixed with sorrow it's always mixed with sadness it's not like the uh, song of the skylark which is only uh, a symbol of happiness so no man's song no human song is ever are only a symbol of true happiness it is happiness mixed with sadness 
yet now yet he wants to suggest something else here he says yet if we could scorn hate and pride and fear if we were things born not to shed a tear I know not how thy joy we ever should come near now he's saying why is it he's telling us why is it that we can never be as happy as the skylark he says because we can we are filled with hate pride and fear these things have corrupted our heart have corrupted our soul and mind and our whole body and our existence he says the feelings of hatred feelings of pride and feelings of fear they have so filled up our souls that we cannot become happy he says and because also we are prone to shed tears we are prone to cry uh, uh, our sadness is manifested through our tears he says and because of these feelings because of these uh, uh, sufferings we can never experience joy joy that this bird or this spirit has better than all measures of delightful sound better than all treasures that in books are found thy skill to poet were thou scorner of the ground now he is here paying tribute to the bird he's paying tribute to the skylark and he says your song is better than all measures of delightful song so you see what he's doing he compared the bird song to so many different objects so many different things throughout the poem and now he gives you his verdict he gives you his conclusion he compared the song of the bird to a poet's words to a poet's poem to uh, the glowworm spreading line to maiden's song to the maiden's music he compared it to the roses fragrance to the sound of the rain then he spoke about why is it that uh, it uh, cannot be happy he also compared the skylark to the moon to the star to the cloud to different objects but then he says now oh, your song it is better than all measures of delightful song there is no sound that is com comparable to your song no song that is comparable to your song it is better than all treasures that in books are found this is all tre treasures no treasure no amount of treasure gold or diamonds can bring so much happiness as your song can or no wealth of ideas intellectual philosophical ideas he says which are found in so many intellectual books he says they are also they also fall short in wisdom in beauty uh, in front of your singing in front of your song thy skill to poets were thou scorner of the ground now the bird he says hardly ever stays on the ground it flies in the sky this is why the poet calls it the scorner thou scorner of the ground he says you are teaching this a skill to the poet teach me half the gladness that thy brain must know such harmonious madness from my lips would flow the world should listen then as i am listening now he's not now doing what he did to in the ode to the west wind uh the way he asked the west wind to become uh, a source of inspiration for him and uh, he asked uh the west wind to uh, or he asked to be one with the west wind he wanted a share in the power of the west wind so that he could spread his ideas and he could bring about change like the west wind could in the same way here now he's asking the bird to teach him but he's not here asking him not to teach him or to share or you know he's not asking a share in the power but he, or in the strength he's asking him 
uh, the word to teach him the gladness, the art to stay happy, the art to stay glad, the art to stay joyous. Such harmonious madness from my lips would flow, the world would listen then as I am listening now. You see, he says, I, he's asking the world to teach him the art of gladness, not how to sing a song, but how to stay happy, how to stay glad. And then he says, the reason is because he says, when I have learned that art, when I have learned to be as happy as you are, from my lips too would flow the song or the music that would arouse the world from its slumber, that would wake it up, that would uh, shake them out of the state they are in and the whole world would listen to me, he says, as I am listening to you, they will be as captivated by my words as, uh, as I am uh, by your singing or by your song. So he is actually seeking inspiration from the bird to spread his own message. But here you see that he does it in a different manner than he does it in Ode to the West Wind. But uh, towards the end, uh, it is all about seeking inspiration as it was in the previous poem. He wants uh, the bird and the song of the bird to be used uh, to spread his own message. He wants the song of the bird to, af uh, to affect him also and to fill him with the energy, with inspiration, uh, to produce poems, to produce a song, to produce words that would bring about change in the people's ideas, in people's feelings uh, and would, uh, they would be able to share uh, his ideas, his feelings, his emotions and a, as a result Shelley envisions, Shelley sees a, uh, and hopes for a better world for the future, in the future. So with this we come to the end of the poem, the, the Skylark and as uh, you saw there was the, at the heart of the poem, the theme of the poem, uh, the message of the poem was similar to the previous poem. Although he adopts a method which is slightly different, he adopts a language also that is different. Uh, these are shorter uh, sentences, these are smaller stanzas maybe less uh, forceful, less powerful, less impactful, but nevertheless uh, it is as beautiful uh, and as convincing as uh, the Ode to the West Wind. The themes also, let's take a brief look at the themes emerging from this poem, you shall see are, are common. The theme, uh, there's a theme of the power of the natural world once again, it's the skylark, although he refers to it as a spirit, it is an, but it is an object of the natural world. It assumes the status of a spirit because for Shelley it is something uh, which has got uh, a soul of its own, which can teach, which can impart lessons and which, uh, which has uh, a moral to give. And the second theme is where he is lamenting the human condition. It is the same theme that he took up in Ode to the West Wind where he was talking about the degenerating values and the systems that were, was degenerating in his times. And the third theme is uh, the power of imagination and which is again similar as is, it was in the Ode to the West Wind. He spoke, uh, he showed us through his poetry how imagination uh, can have uh, an impact on the reader's mind. So he uses it powerfully here again. And the last uh, theme uh, which is which is powerfully uh, which is powerful even in this poem is the role of the poet and the role that a poetry can uh, play in bringing about change or in bringing about reform in the society. So with this we come to the end of the second poem of Shelley and uh, uh, not just with the second poem of Shelley but we come to the end of Shelley himself. In the next lecture I will start with Keats and we will also discuss and analyze his first poem. So I will take leave now, thank you.